Um, no, I grew up going to comic conventions, you know, and I would see these guys, like, watch them, and watch them over the course of, you know, 30, 40 years. And also, you just hear a lot of these stories, like, working in the industry, and, you know, and then you, you know, you know enough people that have stuff that they created for these big companies that turns into things, and they're, you know, I mean, look at, look online at Comics News. The guy created Rocket Raccoon at the Indiegogo at his health expenses, you know, it's like a shitty, you know, it's an industry that a lot of people who love comics, like, throw their whole lives into, and then at the end of their life, they're kind of just cast out. And I really, I've just been hearing stories like that my whole life uh, from people, and there's a really great, uh, insane cartoonist named Al Columbia, who, he was gonna, he was gonna take over Bill, from Bill Sienkiewicz on Big Numbers, and then he, legendarily, though, Al and I had ripped up his issue and, and quit and jumped on a, bus to Seattle and moved into my friend Eric Reynolds' house. And Al and I became really good friends for a couple of years. And Al, when he was Sinkevich's assistant on Big Numbers, they worked in a building that had a bunch of little art studios. And in the art studio next door to theirs, they shared a copier with Stan Drake, who was the guy in the car with Alex Raymond when he killed himself or died. Um, and so Al had these sketchbook pages that were filled with notes he'd written to himself not to end up like Stan. Because Stan at that point had been the greatest artist, one of the greatest artists in the 50s and 60s in mm -hmm. comic strips and comic books. And at that point in his life he was reduced to just making Xeroxes and tracing old pictures of Dagwood Bumstead. Uh, because he had like a bunch of ex-wives and he was an alcoholic and he had all these health problems and so Al said he would just hear him sometimes like lying on the floor in his office like crying. And those stories always stuck with me. And then when I was working with Gene Cole and I, I wrote the last comic Gene Cole and I heard, and Gene Cole created Blade among many other, you know, Marvel characters, Bullseye, I believe, he so created. Um, just a ton of things that these companies had made billions of dollars on. Gene Colan could barely see out of one eye, and he had to have surgery halfway through, and they didn't have enough money to pay for that, and so I helped organize a bunch of people to raise money for mm -hmm. Gene, and so that just always stuck with me, and it just made me sick to my stomach that here's this guy, the Blade movies have made a billion dollars, and they're getting nothing. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what the book is, kind of like a tribute to those guys, and also it's like, we all know this going in, and we all rush into comics anyway because we love comics so much that we're willing to like take a shit deal because you want to do, you know, Spider-Man so bad that you'll, you know, cut up. But it's like that's that's sort of the dichotomy of comics. It's not one thing or another. Like I try to explain to my friends, it's not simple. Like there's a part of me that will always be bitter about some of this stuff, and then there's a part of me that's always glad that I got to do it. So you know, I mean, nothing's ever black and white. It just feels that way on Twitter. <laughs> if the Nazis are terrible, that's <laughs> <not>. <laughs>